Arriving by helicopter under tight security, Defense Secretary Mattis flew right to North Korea's doorstep today and looked out onto the very hills where North Korea has hundreds of rockets and artillery pieces ready to fire in the event of a war. Behind that in the caves is where the long range artillery is. Seoul and its 20 million people are just 35 miles away. North Korea has been practicing for this low-tech assault. Missile defenses would be ineffective. The casualties, enormous. At the border, Mattis came within yards of North Korean soldiers as in a bizarre scene in this tense place. Tourists in the north looked on. Our goal is not war, but rather the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, says denuclearization is a non-starter, but the Trump administration is now trying to show that it's not asking. President Trump arrives in Asia next week with what is effectively an armada. For the first time in years, three U.S. aircraft carrier strike groups are heading to the Pacific, in addition to the some 32,000 U.S. troops already in South Korea. The Navy says the deployment of the carriers was pre-planned. Still, it's a huge show of force to tell North Korea if it attacks Seoul with its artillery or worse, uses its nuclear arms. The U.S. response will be devastating. Lester going to move forward in a very aggressive way and Trump's sit down with him uh, is it couldn't be more consequential. We've also just had the re-election of a very conservative prime minister in Japan and Abe. So a lot of moving pieces in the region. What would you advise the president do when he sits down with President Xi? I mean, that, as you say, that will probably be one of the most important uh, issues. The White House not saying if the president will visit himself, will visit the DMZ. Uh, as you said, Matt, it's on Friday. Yeah. What should the president say finally to the Chinese president? And do you think they have finally uh, gotten the message and potentially are taking the right steps to try to rein in Kim Jong-un? Well, I think he has to make it crystal clear that, you know, th that the calculus in the region has to change. You know, the Chinese see the North Korean uh, nuclear program as a United States problem, a South Korean problem, and a Japanese problem, and not their problem. And we need to work together, the U.S. and China, to shut this program down. I think he needs to make it clear that we do not seek regime change. He can, uh, the Kim can get rid of the program, and the Chinese can still have their buffer state. That's fine. But if that does not uh, proceed that way, then we could see Japan becoming much more aggressive uh, and actually having an offensive capability, which is currently precluded by their constitution. We can reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons into South Korea, which were removed in the 1990s, and that we will take every action necessary to stop this program. But if the Chinese don't stop it, we will. And uh, quickly, do you think the president should go to the DMZ or uh, it's, it's not as symbolic? I do think he should go to the DMZ and not only sends the right message to the region, but importantly, we have to remember we have 30,000 troops in South Korea, 25,000 in Japan, and it sends the message to them that their commander in chief understands what they're going through. Trump's visit to South Korea on the horizon. His top defense chief is touching down in Seoul this morning, where he will head right over to the North Korean border with his South Korean counterpart. There, the closest he can get to the regime's leader from South Korea, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis is set to warn Kim Jong-un against pursuing his nuclear ambitions. Kim Young-bin has more. South Korea and the U.S. are scheduled to hold their annual security consultative meeting in Seoul on Saturday, a day after the Allies' military committee meeting. The meeting on Friday will be led by the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the two sides, while Saturday's meeting will be headed by Seoul's Defense Minister Song Yong moo and its U.S. counterpart, James Mattis. The Allies plan to have in-depth discussions on enhancing extended deterrence against North Korea's ever-expanding nuclear and ballistic missile threats. 
They are also expected to discuss Alliance policies, including the early transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul, which is one of the key goals of the Moon Jae-in administration. The annual meetings are the Allies' top military consultation channels. However, this year's talks mark the first since President Moon and Trump took office. U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis is set to arrive in Seoul early Friday for a second visit as Pentagon chief. He is scheduled to take a tour of frontline units shortly after his arrival. Speaking to reporters this week, Mattis stressed that Washington's top priority is to resolve North Korea issues diplomatically. Mr. Tsong and Mattis met on the sidelines of the ASEAN Defense Minister's Meeting Plus in the Philippines earlier this week. They held their first face-to-face -face at the Pentagon in August. Make no mistake, any attack on the United States or our allies will be defeated. Any use of nuclear weapons by the North will be met with a massive military response, effective and overwhelming. I cannot imagine a condition under which uh, the United States would accept North Korea as a nuclear power. If it remains on its current path of ballistic missiles and atomic bombs, it will be counterproductive in effect. The DPRK will be reducing its own security. So that is Rhode Island Senator and top Democrat on the Senate Armed Forces Committee, Jack Reed, pushing for a more unified rhetoric from the White House on the handling of North Korea. Reed just returned from Seoul, where he says officials are confused by the president's reactions and losing confidence. The rogue regime now saying nuclear war could break out at any moment. Robert Natter is a former U.S. Navy four star admiral and former 7th Fleet commander. Sir, thank you for joining us. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I agree with the assessment that uh, we are getting to the point of uh, uh, either diplomacy is going to succeed or it's going to fail. And that uh, I think this administration has been fairly consistent in saying that they're not going to stand for a nuclear armed North Korea. We'll see uh, where it goes from there. Yeah, that's the opposite of what the former administration, of course, said. Um, National Security Advisor to President Obama, Susan Rice, said that basically we could tolerate a nuclear North Korea, that we have to pretty much accept the inevitable were some of the things that she said. What, what do you, what's your reaction to that statement? Well, my reaction to that statement is that uh, the prior administration and indeed succeeding administrations going back 20 years really, have tried to use the carrot and then the stick and then the carrot, uh, all of which have failed miserably because we are facing a, uh, a dominant threat here that's very serious. And guess who's holding the bag? The American people. Uh, this is not a good situation, and uh, we have not been very good diplomatically yeah. at uh, trying to uh, uh, restrict them. Uh, um, a lot of experts say the reason why this situation is different from the others is because you have a weapon in the hand of someone who doesn't mind starving his people, who doesn't mind apparently killing his own family members, who is, you know, tr truly, in, you know, irrational. I guess we throw that word around a lot, but in this case, it seems that it, it certainly fits. Um, aren't there weapons that we can use to disable, say, their electric grid and other things that would be a step short of actually going to war, but would cause, um, you know, some of these rep weapons to be damaged, destabilized? I mean, what are the other options? Well, look, the, the uh, line between uh, intelligence gathering and intelligence work and an act of war is a very thin line. Uh, I would argue that uh, taking down a nation's uh, uh, electric grid is an act of war. Someone sure. 
or nation did it to us, I would certainly consider that an act of war. Uh, so we've got to be very careful here with what we're suggesting. Uh, the reality, though, is that we've got to exhaust dip diplomatic efforts, and then short of that, uh, uh, yeah. we've, we've got to have ready a military response. Very quick, the president is visiting Asia next month. He might go to the DMZ. Is that provocative? Well, uh, this is not the first time that we've had a head of state go to the DMZ. Uh, and we've had lots of uh, members of Congress go there. So I would say it's not uh, provocative in and of itself. Having said that, Kim Jong-un uh, utilizes any action on our part and calls it provocative. Okay. Sir, thank you. We to the region, North Korean officials say they will not give up their nuclear program. CNN's Will Ripley is in Pyongyang to explain. As Asia prepares for President Trump's landmark visit, North Korea has been uncharacteristically quiet. No missile launches in a month and a half. No nuclear test, at least not yet. Only North Korea's promise to send a clear message after Trump's menacing speech at the UN last month when he threatened to totally destroy North Korea. At the time, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un vowed to tame the U.S. president with fire. Cha Song-chol is chief engineer of a baby food factory, trying to maintain production levels despite U.N. sanctions over North Korea's nuclear program. But he says the nukes are here to stay. <laughs> President Trump knows nothing about the Korean nation, he says. Now he's asking us to give up our nuclear weapons. Ask anyone on the street and they'll say he's a lunatic. His words echo North Korean propaganda. Anti-Trump posters are all over Pyongyang. U.S. and North Korean officials say diplomacy has broken down as the rhetoric has revved up. Pushing two nuclear powers further down a dangerous path. Both sides not ruling out talks altogether, but their positions couldn't be farther apart. On a visit Friday to the demilitarized zone dividing North and South Korea, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis said America's goal is not war. Thank you. But for a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. <laughs> but with Pyongyang closer than ever to achieving what it considers a nuclear balance of power with the U.S., giving up nukes is a non-starter. But you know, there are a lot of people around the world who think that by accumulating nuclear weapons, your country is putting itself at risk of total destruction. They have the wrong information, says Pak Sonok. Tell them to come to my country and see for themselves. Do you have hope that someday your leader, Kim Jong-un, could meet the U.S. President Donald Trump? No, not at all, she says. That meeting cannot happen. It will not happen because our marshal promised to deal with that deranged lunatic with fire. Ominous words slowly simmering ever since. As Trump's visit to the region looms, many wonder if the situation is about. Out 
onto the very hills where North Korea has hundreds of rockets and artillery pieces ready to fire in the event of a war. Behind the, in the caves is where the long-range artillery is. Seoul and its 20 million people are just 35 miles away. North Korea has been practicing for this low-tech assault. Missile defenses would be ineffective. The casualties, enormous. At the border, Mattis came within yards of North Korean soldiers as, in a bizarre scene in this tense place, tourists in the North looked on. Our goal is not war, but rather the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un, says denuclearization is a non-starter, but the Trump administration is now trying to show that it's not asking. President Trump arrives in Asia. Arriving by helicopter under tight security, Defense Secretary Mattis flew right to North Korea's doorstep today. And look.